so apologize for the change of venue. Um, and we are going to start off today with a proclamation, and, and Commissioner Childs is going to read a proclamation for uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Week. Whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection report cancer is the leading cause of death by disease among U.S. children between infancy and age 15. This tragic disease is detected in more than 15,000 of our country's young people each and every year. And whereas one in five of our nation's children loses his or her battle with cancer, many infants, children, teens will suffer from long-term effects of comprehensive treatment, including secondary cancers. And, whereas founded over 20 years ago, the American Cancer Fund for Children Incorporated and Kids Cancer Connection Incorporated are dedicated to helping these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection provide a variety of vital patient psychosocial services to children undergoing cancer treatment at Children's Hospital Colorado in Denver, Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children at the Medical Center of Aurora, as well as participating hospitals throughout the country, thereby enhancing the quality of life for these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection also sponsor courageous kid recognition award ceremonies, community get well cards, and hospital celebrations in honor of a child's determination and bravery to fight the battle against childhood cancer. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Pitkin County designates November 2nd through 8th, 2014 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Week. I don't know if they're presenting this to someone, John, today. I do not believe we have anyone here to accept the proclamation, but we will be sure to uh, get it to the appropriate party. Yeah, they're probably in the old meeting room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, are there any uh, additions or deletions to the agenda today? Mr. Chair, there are no additions or deletions to the agenda. Um, at this point, I will open up the meeting to public comment. Anybody wishing to speak uh, to uh, anything, they may do so at this time. Seeing no public comment, I will close the public comment and open it up to commissioner comments. And I will lead off. Um, last night, as you all know, was one of our elections. And I'd like to start by c congratulating all those that were the uh, victors in the, uh, the vote counts, um, including Patty Clapper, who won the commissioner seat, Rachel, who won her commissioner seat again. So always, it's not official until those votes come in. Um, I'd also like to um, commend those that ran, whether they were on the winning side or the losing side. Um, it's always tough to be part of a political campaign. And excuse me, I'll get a little emotional, um, but as my um, it's my ability here as the chair, I guess. I'm very proud of the time that I've served here as a Picking County Commissioner. And I stand by the, the hard work that I've put in, the collaboration that I've endured and, and sponsored, and the high level of integrity that I've brought to the position. I look forward to serving out the next couple of months with the commissioners. It's been a pleasure being part of this board um, with everybody. And I'd just like to say thank you for the time that I've been involved. I'm just a small business owner here, not, not a, uh, a politician by any means, but I'm glad to be part of the community in the ways that I have been. So thank you. George? Uh, yeah, Rob, I, I want to thank you for, for 
your work here as a fellow board member. Uh, being a public servant, uh, one doesn't get a lot of acc accolades, uh, but you've, you've worked hard and it's been a pleasure serving with you. Um, Rachel, it looks like we'll serve with you for another four years, or at least two for me, perhaps, <laughs> but congratulations. Um, it, this was a difficult election. Um, uh, there was a lot of, as I spoke earlier, uh, there was a lot of money thrown at our state and national um, candidates. Um, we all s see how these uh, <coughs> resulted, not only in Colorado, but throughout the country. And um, it's sort of bittersweet. Uh, we've been able to uh, maintain some of our incumbents, which have done a great job for the state, whether it's Governor Hickenlooper or Representative Millie Hamner. Uh, we're waiting to hear. I haven't heard the latest uh, results for the uh, state Senate race uh, to fill Senator Gail Schwartz's seat. Um, I think probably the most disappointing uh, results for me, and I think for Picking County, and I, I, and I wanted to applaud and congratulate Picking County for coming out uh, strong uh, during this election in the vote. And, and I think, uh, as I had written in one of my columns, I think uh, it was reflected in the values that Pickett County residents have in terms of what makes this such a great community. Um, but when, when we thank our public servants, officials who have served in office, like, like Rob Bittner, uh certainly uh, we need to acknowledge and thank uh, Senator Mark Udall for his tireless work over many years, not only when he was our U.S. Senator, but also in the House of Representatives, for all that he's done, uh, not only for Picking County, but for the state of Colorado and for, and for the country as a whole. So I want to thank you, Mark, for your, your, your dedication, uh, your love for this area and, and, and our state, and I wish you well in the future as well as Rob. Other? Steve? Um, Rob, I would like to thank you for the job you've done the two years that I've served on the board with you. Um, my father once said that he didn't consider himself a politician ever, but that he considered himself a statesman. And they were able to accomplish things in a nonpartisan way and always be look, trying to do things for the good of the community and that's the only way I've seen you ever performing is looking for what's the best thing for the community and weighing all sides of issues and making the best decision irregardless of any political thing so I, I would consider you to be a statesman and not a politician based on what my dad had said thank you Rachel. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I would uh, certainly echo my uh, colleagues' comments uh, regarding your service, Rob, and uh, I know you put in the many miles necessary to make travel commitments and uh, a lot of uh, research and analysis of our, our board's uh, packets, our information. And I think you've contributed greatly to the budget areas and, and a, a lot of shaping this administration. Uh, with John Peacock, so really appreciate that. And uh, I think it's too early for fond farewells because you got two more months worth of meetings <laughs> to go through. Um, I, I guess more broadly on the elections, I'd like to say that uh, you know the greatest of the American traditions is that after an election, no matter how tough, how tight, how negative, we all try as people to come together again to govern for the best of our communities and for our nation. And we are a nation that has many problems in front of us to continue to solve. And so it may take a day or two to shake off the, uh, the fatigue of campaigns, but uh, we have issues. We have uh, climate change in front of us here. We have income inequity, uh, the cost of higher education, the challenge of getting more of our young people competitive in the world global market. We have health care costs. We have health care issues for uh, our lower income residents. And then locally, we still have our issues. We have our plate full. We have Thompson Divide. We have state uh, transportation funding. Uh, we have the state water plan, which will affect us greatly. 
Uh, we have new issues on the table like the transfer of public lands to the states, which is a very strong GOP agenda uh, in our state and in the West, and a lot more Western governors who are going to be championing that cause. And we need to be involved and be a part of that because uh, I, for one, do not want to see our, our public lands um, subdivided, privatized, and gotten on the tax rolls, as the uh, uh, clarion call is from many. So uh, we all have uh, to roll up our sleeves, come together for good solutions that uh, hopefully end gridlock, and um, continue to protect our best interests in the present and, and plan for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move to our consent action items. We have some approvals of minutes. We've got work session minutes of October 14th, regular minutes of October 22nd, and special meeting minutes of October 28th. Do we have any adjustments or a motion? Move to approve. Second. We have a first and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Next, we will move to our consent action. Uh, first reading set for public hearing on November 19th, uh, an ordinance authorizing the execution of five uh, license agreements on airport rental car operations. And Brian Griefe is here to present. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Griefe, Assistant Aviation Director for Administration at the Aspen Airport. As indicated, uh, this is a resolution or an ordinance resolution <laughs> um, to approve um, five rental car concessions at the airport. This was done because our previous concessions, our contracts are expiring. It's something we do every three years. Uh, those are expiring at the end of the month. We went out uh, earlier this fall, um, late summer, to start the process again. We went through an RFP process. We were fortunate enough to have seven rental car concessionaires interested in it. We have space for only five. Um, went through the process of selecting facilities. Um, that has been done, and before you today is the agreement with those selections. Um, also, you'll notice that those are signed by the respective companies, um, so they have agreed to all the provisions in the document. Any questions? Steve? Uh, Brian, I, I was curious about the, having the seven different co companies had applied and the two that didn't get selected, which are Enterprise and Dollar Thrifty, are, do they have operations in Picking County now, like at the airport business center? Enterprise does. To my knowledge, Dollar Thrifty does not. We will be making available through this process an off-airport agreement, where if they did want to serve the airport, they would be able to. They just wouldn't have space allocated to them on the airport. Okay. Um, that's what I was thinking. Enterprise was the one I think I had heard of. Also, Go Rental was at the ABO operation um, at Atlantic Aviation. Is that, I mean, I know you don't control that space as, uh, through the airport. It's Atlantic Aviation that does that, but uh, do you happen to know what they're going to use their space for at this point? Yep. Uh, my understanding is they will continue their operation there, um, so they'll still be serving the FBO, Atlantic. They'll also have the presence in the terminal building, so they'll have a counter and storage space. Most likely the storage space that's provided that they're leasing, they'll be able to cross-utilize between both operations. Okay. So they'll actually have some cars parked down there by Atlantic Aviation also, in addition to the lots 5 and E? That's correct. Okay. No questions? Is there a motion? Steve? I would move to approve the ordinance of the Picking County Commissioners of Picking County authorizing execution of five license and use agreements for on-airport rental car operators at the Aspen Picking County Airport. Is there a second? second? We have a first and a second. This is set for our public hearing on November 19th. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next, we have a ordinance uh, for facility use agreement with Mountain Rescue. Any 
Kara is here to present. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Kara Silvernagel with um, the County Manager's Office. And before you is a use agreement with Mountain Rescue for um, the Sheriff's Office and an emergency dispatch center. As you guys are aware, the Mountain Rescue building was complete in September. The county had contributed funds towards the capital costs of building that, and this is um, the agreement authorizing the Sheriff's Office for use of the facility for a training, um, an emergency dispatch center, as well as an uh, emergency operations center as well. Um, I had one question. In the terms of use, it says that this is until December 31st, 2063? Yes. So it's a... It's a 50-year use agreement. And, and it's a 50-year use agreement that we have um, a contribution of $7,500 to. Do we have exit clauses through there, or is that... Yeah, um, within two years, because both... MRA and the Sheriff's Office weren't sure in particular the training facility how often that was going to be used. They have a clause in here that within two years they're going to revisit how often they are actually using the facility and revisit those costs of shared utilities. And, and I guess part of my concern, the reason I bring this up is because we're looking at a new facilities, um, a new facility that would house some of our security stuff and, and part of the sheriff's office and what we would implement there versus using an external facility like the mountain rescue place. Right. Um, we haven't designed that yet, so we don't know what those facilities are going to entail. To, so to get into a 50-year agreement mm -hmm. um, seems kind of long. Right. Maybe I'll uh, jump in here. Rob, one of the um, ideas with a emergency operation center as well as an incident command post is that uh, a best practice in communities is to have redundancy so that if we were to have an event, for example, in downtown uh, Aspen that would maybe make uh, facilities downtown unusable um, then we would want to have a backup uh, location right now we don't have a primary location so mountain rescue would serve as our primary location going in uh, it's very possible that we'll have um, duplicated facilities if you will uh, in in downtown aspen but what this does is it provides redundancy um, with a geographic separation in case there's an incident that would make um, one area unusable or, or less usable. And we saw a lot of economies of scale, and, and I, I think the board supported this when we did the original uh, budget supplemental um, with, with uh, Mountain Rescue quite a while back now. Um, but the, the idea was really we could have that redundancy and achieve a lot of economies of scale by partnering with Mountain Rescue for that. So it's in, um, in the payment section, section three, it talks about in 2016 there would be a determination of ag it would, we, we reevaluate the, the 7,500. But it really, it didn't seem to speak to, well, what if we can't come to an agreement there and then we're in this 50-year contract? That's, that was my concern with it, is if it's, we're only using it a little and it should be 3,000 and they still want the 7,500, um, why not make it a two-year contract with a 48-year option after that's reevaluated or another five-year option to be reevaluated on those time periods? We, we wanted to be sure that we locked in use of the facility for the initial capital investment, and so I think our, our interest was um, more in keeping with that. And then we agreed to evaluate the um, operating contrib contributions on an ongoing basis, um, I think not necessarily with an eye that they would go uh, down necessarily, but with an eye towards um, are we utilizing the facility more and should they should they be going up. I think we've got it at a pretty de minimis um, kind of use and contribution right now. No, so I that's the agree. reason. I was just yeah. the way the contract was worded. So that makes sense that it's this is the minimal amount and it might go up from there. Right. We're locked, we, they're locked in to letting us use the facilities for 
that minimal amount. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Other questions? Steve. Well, Rachel? Well, I, I just want to make a comment. I appreciate um, the review of the contract in that way. Um, but I, I just continue to see Mountain Rescue as being such a great partner with our sheriff's office, with the ambulance district, with the community. And, uh, you know, if you're out there when they do engage in a um, search and rescue mission, you know, you see it's just this tremendous interplay between the agencies and the cooperation that leads often to successful saves as opposed to just recoveries. And um, so I, I'm, I'm feeling good about the full faith in the partnership that we have and this contract and uh, that they've both come forward to reach a reasonable amount. And I might add that they had a successful save this weekend. Yes. On the Maroon Bell, so. Uh, is there a motion? I would um, move to approve the ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners of Picking County, Colorado, approving a facility use agreement with Mountain Rescue Aspen. Second. Uh, and this is set again for public hearing on November 19th. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we move on to our consent public hearing second readings, and we've got a um, an ordinance uh, authorizing the acquisition of Call Creek uh, property. And Matt's here to speak to that. Matt Adeletti with Pickens County Open Space and Trails. I have a, a map here I wanted to bring up for you as well. See if it recognizes it. Try that once more. Mm, it's not. Oh, there we go. This is the Schumacher properties, lots 10 and lot 11, totaling 70 acres. This, is, um, this item is here for the second reading and public hearing. The county proposes, or the staff proposes, to pr acquire the 70 acres as uh, open space. There is, I don't have a, I don't have my laser pointer with me, but there is the Avalanche Ranch Outfitters, which are down by the Coke ovens, which has a stable and several outbuildings. Oh, thanks. <laughs> which is down I think you have to use the mouse on the screen <laughs> okay well it's down by the coke ovens <laughs> um, and the county will be uh, the purchase price is 1.8 million dollars the healthy rivers and stream board is desiring to contribute two hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards this purchase and that part and I'll bring up another map here And that part of the purchase will go towards uh, helping and funding the property, that portion of the property which is north of the road and the road I've got drawn in in purple there, um, right along there. So it would be the northern part of the property which would include the structures and the water rights as well. So that part of the purchase would go towards that. And the uh, one of the questions that was brought up at the first reading by Rachel was uh, the name, the naming of the property. We're originally looking at calling it Schumacher Open Space, but um, Rachel had brought up we should put the name Coal Creek in there as well, and the owners are amenable to that. So we'd be calling it the uh, Coal Creek Schumacher property. And Steve had brought up the um, the idea of possibly, excuse me, uh, keeping the stables operating on the property as well. And we've been in touch with the owner of Avalanche Outfitters. And they're taking the, the winter off from running operations up there, but they would be uh, they would like to have talks with us in the spring to possibly get operations running back there again. During the winter, he said it's just not a profitable biz profitable business, especially to keep um, horses up there and to keep them 
uh, fed and all that and to keep the carriage and all that uh, running. So he's taking the winter off from that. So at this point, um, we're just kind of considering what we'll do with it during the winter and we're open to any, um, any, any ideas. So, so the um, staff asks the um, county to, uh, or the commissioners to approve this purchase at its second reading. Commissioner, questions? George? Uh, so, so this, uh, the purchase of this is a, uh, maybe the first in, in a sense that it's a, it's a joint collaboration funding not only from the Open Space and Trails Fund, but also from the Healthy Rivers and Streams Fund as well? Correct. So um, the total purchase price is $1.8 million, and Healthy Rivers and Stream would contribute $250,000 of that. Question? Yeah, Steve. Um, one, I'm a little bit concerned about the the prospect of what would be built there for in terms of trying to clean up Coal Creek, because there's there's such a huge amount of sediment coming down Coal Creek, and I mm -hmm. um, I ha I just I'm a little bit uneasy on you know what might happen or what would be allowed to happen legally in terms of water rights and diverting water to clean it and put it back in the river and that sort of thing. Certainly, and maybe, and I think maybe John Ely could address, John that. Should address that. Just the idea of the concept of uh, what would what is foreseen there. I think John would be the appropriate person to answer yeah. that question. Well, Steve, uh, it's not much of an answer yet. Um, I'm anticipating the majority of the winter would be uh, consumed by analyzing just exactly what a, uh, um, a development would look like to slow down the velocity of that water and allow for sedimentation before the water is returned into Coal Creek and then it flows into the crystal. Uh, the idea, of course, is to uh, improve the water quality of Coal Creek to such an extent that it's uh, not only measurable from a, uh, a turbidity um, or suspended solids point of view, but is uh, actually very much visible to anybody who would simply look down at that compound <coughs> and not see that streak of, of mud hitting uh, the Crystal River. Um, so uh, once that, that plan starts to take shape and what the necessary components would be to accommodate the amount of, of sediment uh, that is uh, within Coal Creek and, and uh, the deposition of that sediment and uh, into a, uh, um, in a, a, a dynamic system that would uh, allow for vegetation to grow up through it in, in effect uh, such that there isn't like an annual clean out sort of a, an operation but really just the establishment of a functional wetland on the property um, that will bring that back to the uh, well to all the boards that are involved the uh, open space and trails board the Healthy Rivers and Streams Board, as well as the BOCC, of course, and then the board can decide at that, or the boards can decide through recommendations and through ultimate action what exactly you want to take uh, out of that creek and how much you would have to consume the property to do it and, and, um, and what it would look like. So it's, uh, ultimately it's going to be a decision for some later date, uh, but the acquisition of the property Preserves the ability to talk about it at all. Uh, without the acquisition of this property, uh, I just don't see the quality of Coal Creek improving significantly over time. Uh, the county has invested, I would say, significant funds in trying to assist efforts, efforts at revegetation up into uh, Coal Basin uh, and uh, in the vicinity of the uh, Dutch Creek mines and, and even higher up. But the, the area of disturbed land um, that is disturbed as a consequence of the mining activity and just as a consequence of, of the type of soil uh, and material that are up there on the hillsides naturally is, is presents quite a dilemma and I don't think revegetation efforts are ever going to reduce the sediment load significantly so the acquisition of the property presents more of the uh, the prospective ability to address Cold Creek 
water quality than outlying a present plan and uh, and a development scenario for the property. If if um, to have any effort be successful, we'd have to divert more than the 1.3 CFS that's the water right that's correct. from that ditch, and then that would would that require a water right from it the state and an augmentation plan to account for evaporation or loss of water in the in the whole process? It depends on what the plan looks like. If the water is being retained at all, then uh, there would have to be an accounting for evaporation. If the water is being retained in a minimal amount or is so soaking into the ground essentially and flowing back into the creek as groundwater, um, then perhaps not. And the timing of diversions also would uh, come into play. The, uh, the water being um, diverted onto the property would be done at a, in a high water profile, in other words, the beginning of the runoff, uh, lasting into probably the, the month of June, um, and then perhaps to a lesser extent um, to just preserve the, the, the wetlands that are produced as a consequence of this. Um, depending on how the plan works out, there might not even be a need to continue to divert that um, one, one and one point six five and change CFS onto the property, and that water can actually be transferred to some other agricultural uh, consumptive use down the crystal um, to benefit somebody who is currently shorted. Okay. So you feel good about that? This property really has good potential, and it's really the only chance we have for having an impact on the turbidity in the creek? I think it's the best chance, no question. How, how, how well it plays out is, is just an unknown, and it would take some time to analyze it, certainly longer than any reasonable diligence period. The fact that the property as a whole is attractive uh, for open space acquisition and use independently of improvements on Coal Creek means that the acquisition has a a logical basis for proceeding um, and uh, and we'll just we'll see what we can do to utilize the property to the greatest extent for the benefit of the creek and for you know open space preservation and, and everything else okay thanks other questions I, I have a question um, a lot of our open space and trails our open space and trails acquisitions for open space purposes have conservation easements put on them seeing that there is a potential development aspect with some of this do we hold off on that and how that and what's the requirement under our expenditures of these funds to have certain conservation easements on on this property there's no requirement for a conservation easement whatsoever okay you know, we're buying the property outright in fee uh, so we will have the maximum ability to, uh, to manage the property. The portion of the property that uh, Matt outlined as being attributed to Healthy Rivers and Streams funds uh, will preserve an even greater degree of flexibility for management and use of the property as well as the water asset. So um, to, to consider putting a conservation easement on the property now I think is, is definitely premature. So we just don't know how the how the um, how the use of the property might shape up yeah but potentially down the road there'd be a conservation easement on part of it if I know we looked at this with the McBride property with development and <coughs> even right. with fences and that sort of stuff well with McBride uh, and other properties when we've done the conservation easement it's typically associated with an event where we didn't acquire the underlying fee but we we're, we're acquiring something less than that and, and typically our interest is expressed as a conservation easement interest but when the property is acquired in, in total in fee by the county the need for a conservation easement really isn't there it's, it's definitely going to be protected into the future um, if, uh, if for some reason the board wanted to convey out a conservation easement interest to another party on the property, it's certainly free to do so. Any other questions? 
Is there a motion? It's a public, oh, it's a public, public, public uh, comment. Yeah. I know Sorry. Peter. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to do that, Peter. Come on up. Mayor? Yeah, please. Okay. I'll uh, just come up to a mic and introduce yourself. Okay. My name is, is Peter Martin. I, I'm a resident of Redstone for 30 years. and uh, I, I know the property and have owned property around Redstone. And I have some comments on this. I want to be a positive force. I'm not up here to be a naysayer, but I want some things for you to consider. And I wrote a couple of letters, which I don't think have been shared with you, which I would like to hand out, if I may. Uh, uh, I believe I we saw an earlier letter, but I'm not sure if we've seen all of them. Did you see the June 9 letter? When we first talked about this, I, I know we got it by email from you as well. Okay, I, it went to open space, and I... Uh, do you want to just bring it up here just yeah. for our reference? Well, just so we have a copy to see if it's the letter that we saw. Thank you. Okay. It's the second letter. It's the first one. I'm going to comment about this meeting. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Uh, well, where to start? If you're familiar with the letter, uh, I wanted, to, I, I, I spent hours and hours writing this, and and thinking about it, and want to be a positive force, but I I question whether this is the proper use or best use of the funds, with other properties that you could be spending the money on, such as Sawmill Hill and other places around Redstone. Right now, Redstone is kind of hemmed in, by the property below town, below uh, just just north of town with the Argyros purchase, which I owned at one time. Um, Bighorn Ridge, which is on the east side of town, which I and Dale Darnell developed 57 acres into four parcels up there. And incidentally, it was zoned uh, 10 acres and we settled for four, so you have a right to limit development, I know that. And uh, then, of course, the, your recent acquisition of Sawmill Hill, we're kind of hemmed in on three sides. And I have some concern about whether we should be hemmed in on four. But I understand uh, the public interest may be in, in owning this land, but I do have reservations about it. I've tried to express them politely here and, and in a positive way. Um, is this the most appropriate use of your funding? And could this be done, this, this improvement of the settlement issue be done without your purchasing the property? And my limited experience would be yes, you can make it a condition of development to reserve the right to do these improvements as you see fit as a condition of development uh, when somebody came in to uh, ask for a building permit. I, th I think you could do that. Uh, I'm going through this real quick here and, and be glad, we'll be glad to answer any questions. I've also questioned the, the price of the property. I'm not an appraiser, but I've owned a lot of property around there and I'm kind of surprised at the price on this and uh, had urged you to consider that. And it's in my first letter there. If you've read it, you, you know what I dealt with that. Now, having said that, I, if you've decided to do this, and I will support it, uh, I think it's very important that we maintain the right to maintain a, a, a stable operation down there, and that's in this top letter, that so that you have a, a residence and a barn and the things that are necessary. We can't just have a temporary operator coming in there with a trailer and some temporary corrals. Uh, the people in Redstone use the stable operation. I use it when I have company. I use it myself personally. And everybody enjoys the sleigh rides at Christmas, and I want to be sure that that's reserved. And I, I looked at the uh, chapter, or Title 12 of the Open Space Act, and uh, I've always worried about your having the right and discretion to allow these things unless they're reserved in the acquisition documents. And so I have urged that you put something in the acquisition documents in the deed that is reserved to the discretion of the Board of County Commissioners, a stable operation which would uh, provide a barn and living quarters for the operator thereof. And I think that can be done. And that's very important. I don't know anybody in Redstone 
who is opposed to that. I think we're all in favor of it. And if you're going to acquire the property and you decide that's the best thing to do, please consider uh, making sure that you have the right to allow these operations and to encourage them. Now, I've been there for 30 years, and that stable operation is operated every winter. And I know uh, Bo and Nicole, and uh, they own property uh, adjacent to Redstone. I think they're going to live there uh, or have a house there ultimately. Uh, we've had some problems over there, and there have been complaints to you guys about the um, target practice uh, that goes on sometimes into the evening indefinitely. And you have the right to prohibit that, but that's, a, that's an internal affair that you can easily regulate. As a matter of fact, your open space rules uh, have a thing about firearms on open space property. But I'd like to see you uh, protect that property. I, if, I, if I were a commissioner, I'd have some consideration about whether the property would best be used to develop Sawmill Hill uh, and to build some trails through there or to build the bicycle trail to finish that. But that's your call. And I'll be supportive of whatever you decide. I just want you to consider these things. And I've tried to express it in my letter, and I'm not going to belabor you with it. Um, but I am a big supporter of open space. I admire them, and I admire this commission. And I just wanted to share these thoughts with you. They are not casual. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time trying to express them politely. So I'll be glad to answer any questions or to elaborate on this as you see fit. Thank you, Peter. Um, let's go through public comment first, and then if there's questions directly towards stuff that you've stated from a commissioner, we'll, we'll get you back okay. up here. Is there any other public comment on this item? Yes. Just come up to the mic and uh, state your name for the record. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Beer, and I live in Redstone, and um, I've been watching the, this um, <clears throat> open space situation. And like Peter, I have some reservations, but at the same time, um, understanding that it's probably going to go through, I have, uh, I appreciate what you're trying to do, and uh, the property could go into private hands and nobody would have any use of it, or it can go into your hands and hopefully we all can benefit. Um, <coughs> Peter touched on the fact that the stables have been there. They've been there for probably 35, 40 years uh, through a, a different ownerships and different leases, uh, but have always contributed to Redstone in, in a lot of ways, um, particularly for the tourist operation, um, which I'm also involved in. I'm a real estate broker there, and also we have a lodging business. And so um, these things make, are important on both sides. Uh, particularly in the lodging world. The um, stables have uh, also, uh, and the Schumachers and previous owners, have allowed the um, sled dog races to be held there, have allowed numerous functions to be held there, and I commend them for that. Um, there's a, an area, along with the stables, there's an area down by Coal Creek that has been historically, well, I won't say historically, but has been used for many, many years uh, as a gathering place for for instance, Redstone has held its Oktoberfest there, uh, local festival they've held. Um, RCA, the Redstone Community Association, has had functions there. There have been weddings, there have been birthdays, there have been reunions. <coughs> it's a great facility along Coal Creek. And it's, a, it's an alternate to taking over the Redstone Park, which I feel is probably something more for the guests and tourists who visit Redstone. And I would like... Um, you and open space if possible to consider these type of operations and even uh, I don't know what your charter says but I think there's an opportunity to um, acquire some revenue from this uh, to help uh, manage the property and maybe go into more acquisitions uh, I think there could be a committee there could be a uh, a group in Redstone that would be voluntarily take this on and uh, administer it um, as, a, as a community process and community project. Uh, it used to be a cross-country ski area for many years. So I think there's a number of opportunities there. And by the way, there is uh, some significant erosion at the very 
western end of the property going into the Coal Basin Road, and I'm not sure if that's on this piece or not, but probably should be looked at. But I, I think it can be a real resource for the community, and hopefully that's what our goal here is, is to benefit the community at large, both our guests and the residents. So um, I would ask you to consider keeping those um, facilities uh, in operation or ability to operate <coughs> and maybe making a little more permanent um, presence so we and others could use it. And again, to excuse me, to consider uh, the possibility of uh, the income potential out of that to help support future uh, management. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, does anybody else want to make public comment at this time? Seeing none, I will close the public comment and bring it back to the board. George? Um, thank you for those, uh, for those remarks from Peter and from Jeff. Um, a response or some comments to uh, to your comments um, this this piece of property is on the market uh, it could be sold to a, a private individual uh, by right uh, those individuals can build up to 5750 without any uh, caveats at all in terms of our ability to to negotiate we we, we can only negotiate uh, perhaps when they look to go above what's granted uh, by right in terms of their building site. So, so uh, our ability to, to preserve this or to try to utilize this as part of um, uh, a, a water collection uh, for settlement uh, really falls upon open space and healthy rivers and streams versus trying to rely on an individual homeowner and I want to um, commend the Schumachers for, for their long contribution uh, in terms of opening up this property for the benefit of Redstone. And as I think as you and most of the residents in Redstone appreciate um, that when, when Open Space does purchase property up in Redstone it is a benefit not only for Pickens County but for the residents of Redstone um, when you cited some some of the properties you mentioned Peter and when you look at the coke ovens in particular uh, in terms of a process in terms of the, the the potential use of this property I think uh, you and the residents of Redstone have seen uh, when open space does a purchase uh, they go through a very extensive elaborate public process uh, to gather input in terms of how to manage that process, that, that property. Uh, Elk Park is, is a prime example, of which had a tremendous amount of community input uh, and has led to, I think it's going to be a, a, an extremely successful amenity for the town of Redstone. And I see no less uh, when, if this passes, the purchase of this property, that uh, when open space starts to work on a management plan, that a lot of these issues and concerns will will be available as part of that master plan as it goes forward. So rather than trying to uh, put something in in the resolution now, I would suggest that we wait and go through a master planning process and have full community input, a public process to really determine the best use of this property. Rachel. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, well, Jeff and uh, Peter, thank you for your comments. And to clarify, this wasn't the exact letter I saw this summer, but it was something from you regarding whether some residential development would be a good way to lower the price as well as concern about the stables. And it, it certainly became part of our uh, discussions while we were uh, considering this purchase in executive session um, as we do negotiations in executive session, but th those thoughts made it forward through the process. Um, so my comments are similar to George's. Um, um, I, and, and during the first reading on this, I think uh, I mentioned, and, and Steve and others, um, the desire to maintain the stable operations so that uh, we understand it's an important economic driver and economic sustainability element for the Redstone community. Um, I was unaware of the festivals or weddings or picnics, 
um, on the property as well, and so that's good additional information. I'm wondering uh, more for our attorney and open space and trails, it's not that you have to fulfill a reservation, but is it more necessary to have a reservation of those tangential uses now so that they are not prohibited by the open space enabling legislation once we've used those funds? Well, one of the reasons for drawing that purple line that Matt was talking about on the property that traces the, the alignment of the existing dirt road <coughs> to the property, recognizing expenditures of healthy rivers and streams funds for the northern and western uh, portion of the property of that from that line, as well as the water rights, is to preserve some degree of flexibility. Um, first, to accommodate um, the reduction of the sediment coming out from Coal Basin through Coal Creek, we probably need uh, the majority of, of, uh, of the property as described by that line. Um, secondly, the restrictions on the use of funds from the Healthy Rivers and Streams um, uh, program is not the same as with Open Space and Trails. Uh, the Healthy Rivers and Streams uh, fund just doesn't have any restrictions at all other than that it be used for that purpose and to that end uh, such that there is a, a reasonable nexus of the expenditure of funds. So for example, to address the comments from Peter and Jeff, the continuation of the uh, stable or even the relocation of the stable within that area is uh, completely uh, possible and not prohibited through the, the county's charter. The, um, the utilization of the portion of the property, which essentially is the high higher parts of the property, the most developable portions of the property, I would say, along Coal Creek Road, which is attributable to the Open Space and Trails Fund, once the acquisition goes forward, then that property would not be uh, available for any sort of development or, or utilization other than, than open space and managed consistent with the, um, the stated objectives of the program, which are outlined in the charter. What the board could consider, however, is to include within the acquisition ordinance the possibility of being able to uh, sell or lease um, a portion of that property. Um, that goes to the comments of Peter particularly uh, for use of the property to some other end. It does not set up a consequence that that would necessarily happen. It just preserves the option for that eventuality. Yeah. Without it, it just it wouldn't be possible at all. And so I don't know if the board wants to consider that uh, or, or not. The board did not want to uh, um, incorporate language like that on the first reading, uh, but then again, the board didn't have the benefit of public comments. Rachel? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would rather maintain the flexibility especially as we're going to go through a management master planning <coughs> process with the community as well as vetting the size and scale and uh, requirements of the water filtration elements and I just would hate to get further down the road and find out that you know we need to swap parcels within the or, or locations within the parcel or it's uh, more or less um, you know I'm I, I'd raised the question, I think we discussed it perhaps at the last public meeting, should there be some residential development or not? And th th there was an overall feeling that the, um, the parcel should be preserved as much as possible in the natural state, that one or two homes there would not really contribute per se to the redstone economy and, and the vitality in that classic sense. They may very well be empty second homes in the future or anything like that and would diminish the um, natural characteristics of the land. But I, I want to make sure that we're able to have the flexibility in the uses going forward. And, you know, maybe it's just a broader question for you, Matt, to answer, but can people get a special use permit to hold a wedding on a on our open space parcels now or can they just tell all their friends to meet there at noon and you know is that a violation of a policy or uh, how, do, how does that sort of thing work actually I'm gonna let Dale and Dale you have to come um, to a microphone if you're gonna talk. yeah Rachel we do have a special event permit process for open space and um, we recently overhauled that and uh, created some flexibility for open space to permit some of these smaller events independently of the county's special event permit process overall. 
Um, we tend to base the breadth of what's allowed on the management plans that are adopted. So um, you wouldn't be able to hold a wedding at North Star because of the management plan there. But uh, we do have those kinds of events happening at Elk Park, which is also under the open space program, or Redstone Park, rather. So okay. we can accommodate those kinds of requests based on the management planning for the property. Okay. Well, thank you for that clarification. So that doesn't sound like an extra reservation we need to make in this contract, but the potential, the flexibility of um, a stable operations does seem to be, is that something we need to make more of a reservation in this contract before it's finalized, John? The, uh, a reservation isn't made in the, in the contract itself. The contract is simply the instrument uh, that establishes obligations between the seller and the purchaser, the Schumachers and the, and the county. Uh, and that document is, uh, is fairly refined. It doesn't need to be tweaked at all. Well, what we're talking about is in addition to the recitals of the ordinance, which enables the execution of the contract. Um, and so, for example, uh, if the county wanted to see a residential uh, development go in or the <coughs> stable operation relocated or some other uh, community amenity that would constitute development, up higher on the property, for example, without the without the ability to do so stated within the ordinance, uh, that would not be there. The stable operation, for example, the way it's set up now is through a leasehold. I would imagine that any, or at least the most uh, logical way to go forward to maintain a stable operation is with a lease. Uh, if uh, if we wanted to relocate the stable operation or so, or something else. Uh, on the property and wanted to afford that operator some degree of permanence such that uh, they would feel more justified in investing some money into the operation than, and we wanted to do a lease on the property without the reservation uh, being outlined in the ordinance allowing the acquisition and we wouldn't be able to do it. Well, and that's apart from special I events. Guess so I, yeah. I mean uh, improvements on the land. Personally, I would like to add something to that effect in the recitals here so that we have uh, secured that opportunity. Um, George? Um, Dale, this is not that unusual. We have done purchases that have a fee simple that have included the ability to sell off a portion of the land if giving us that flexibility. Right, that was authorized by a charter amendment in 2006. And on properties like this one where there's multiple potential demands in the future, it's a, it's a safety valve. We did it with the Emma Town site, for example. Yeah, so I, I, would, I would agree with Rachel that I would like to have it fairly broad in the language to uh, allow the potential for either a sale or a lease a portion of the property, but not have a specific use at this point. Yeah, I, I could agree with that. I think it's worth giving some direction to future boards, though. It may be a while before the management plan is in place, or one management plan can evolve to another, so that uh, if we were clear we were looking for um, recreational amenities that support the uh, community of Redstone and provide opportunities for the community of Redstone for social gatherings or something like that. So that wasn't too wide open. Mm -hmm. So I would, just to follow up a little bit there, I would agree in terms of keeping it broad, but maybe in the recitals, because it does point out, and in, in number three of the recitals, it points out, possesses scenic agricultural habitat resources and that a, rec a management plan <coughs> will reflect that but maybe also reflect some of its uses, its, its previous uses, such as the outfitting operation and um, community events of some sort, and then leave the contract or, or leave the, uh, the further information to be a little bit more broad, but that way future boards have this resolution as this ordinance as part of that information in there. Rachel? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if perhaps um, the easiest way to pursue this would be to take any additional board comments and uh, then continue this to later on in the meeting 
and allow our attorney in open space and trails to craft an appropriately worded amendment to the to the ordinance and then we could take it up later this afternoon and add the amendment and vet that language and and go go forward with the the program steve did you want to weigh in yeah i wanted to weigh in on this um i also would like to keep our options open with the maximum amount of flexibility because I know I would really like to take into account the desires of the residents of Redstone and in forming a management plan really consult with local residents as to you know what they would like to see for the property I'm totally in favor of us purchasing this property now because if it went into private hands all these different options we're talking about would be off the table and out of our control but I also want to keep keep the options open when we do purchase it so that um, you know the stables could continue we might be able to sell off a couple of home sites on it um, people could still hold their weddings there we could do the, the water um, the plan for the cleaning the water in Coal Creek um, and I think if we if we could get this later in the meeting today let's let's go for that would that be possible John Sure. so would you accept a motion so it yeah I'm just looking for a, a uh, what our process is here in terms of are we a motion to continue later in the meeting today or or yeah, you table can just, you can just table this right now and we'll in, and call it back up uh, momentarily I mean the meeting I think is relatively uh, abbreviated today and uh, you know this won't take long to to uh, craft a recital you guys would draw out your conversation on my okay. right now. Robert, <laughs> just like give us a comment from the seller's representative here as well. yes come on up Tim Or you can sit in this you chair. Can sit in the chair over here. <laughs> you have to get down on your hands and knees. I understand. <laughs> I understand these mics don't work, but uh, um, do I'm Tim Cottrell. I'm I'm with I'm the uh, owners, the sellers representative uh, in this process, and I wanted to. I really we really appreciate Jeff's and and Peter's comments about maintaining this. That has been the sellers' wish all along, that that some operation outfitting operation and the sleigh rides and so forth it, to everybody's best interest continue uh, while a current lessee who is vacating the property uh, at his own will not not due to Picking County open space or the sellers uh, under considerations of what it takes to run for the winter um, there are discussions going on about maintaining that separately and I just uh, it's too early to say more than that about it but there's a very good chance that that will operate still this winter and uh, I, I thought that would be helpful for the Redstone people in particular to understand that's always been the desire and uh, we're looking into that not not to obviously tell the county how they can operate it but I think for everybody's interest I want to make sure that was understood thank you Tim yeah. George um, I, I th I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve this and I think um, our attorney can craft a one or two sentence uh, to be included as a recital right now I don't think we need to delay it too much he probably is already done. So, if you can uh, read the language and add it to the ordinance, it's a separate motion. Uh, of, uh, as an additional recital to the, uh, to the ordinance that uh, Matt has in his packet, consistent with Home Rule Charter Section 13.5.3, the board recognizes that it may be in the interest of the community and it, it may be the interest of the, uh, the public at large uh, to utilize the property for purposes that are not currently anticipated. It is therefore the intention of the board to recognize the availability of a portion of the property for sale or lease. And that's sufficient to 
cover all our bases. Great. I would make a motion to amend the ordinance to include that language. I'll second it. I would also note that there's a typo. There are two recital fours in the ordinance that we have in front of us. Small thing, but. And to correct the typo. Include that. Got that. <laughs> uh, we have a first and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Well, and now we need to make the motion to pass the ordinance. That was just to amend it to include the recital. Okay, I, I would, I just lost. I'll make a motion to um, approve authorizing the acquisition of the Cold Creek Schumacher property. As amended. As amended. Thank you, Rachel. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jeff and Peter, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate your considering all of our concerns. Uh, next, we have a uh, resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Aspen for the purpose of shared license of fiber optic cables. Good afternoon. I'm <coughs> Ryan Keith. I work for the uh, county's business information and technology services department. This is the um, uh, second reading for this intergovernmental agreement with the city of Aspen to continue to share our um, uh, fiber network with them. Um, I do not have uh, much additional add from the first, first reading other than to make some comments that were based on the uh, direction given by Commissioner Richards from the first reading, which was to see if we could obtain from the city some of the criteria they used to determine the fees, uh, the $42,000 annual fee. Uh, for continued uh, shared use of that fiber. I did meet with Jim Considine, City of Aspen's IT director, last week. Uh, he's, he sat down with me for about 15 minutes, and uh, the notes from that meeting I have added uh, to the packet today, so hopefully you don't have a chance to review that. Uh, those comments from, from Jim, you know, I'll certainly be happy to uh, answer any questions specific to that. Uh, but with that said, uh, I, I respectfully ask the board to... Uh, uh, open this to public hearing today and to approve this uh, resolution on a second reading. Questions? Rachel? Yeah, um, I really want to thank you for getting that backgrounding work. It, it uh, makes a lot of difference to my understanding of the issue and to the justification of the expense to the public. It's really hard to just get a number which seemed to be out of thin air. And I do think the city uh, went pretty far in justifying what its expenses were and what its expectations were of investments it made. So I appreciate the uh, work, and I will be voting to support this. Additional questions? Motion? Oh, this is a public hearing. Anybody wishing to speak on this may do so at this time. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Is there a motion on the table on the, from the board? I'd move to approve the resolution authorizing the board to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Aspen for the purpose of sharing a license for fiber optics cable. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Rob, the next one's going to be a little longer. Do you think we could go ahead and take yeah, a break? Yeah, let's take a five minute, or let's take a ten minute break. Great, thank you.
You're ready. Uh, thank you, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners, Pickham County, Colorado. Today is Wednesday, November 5th, and we're moving to our land use action items. Uh, first is a Warren Creek Mountain LLC minor amendment, <clears throat> and Mike Kramer is here to present. Okay, thanks. Mike Kramer <coughs> with Pickham County Planning Staff. <coughs> Applicant, as you said, Rob, is Warren Mountain Creek, LLC. The location is 44010 Highway 82, east of town. And the applicant, uh, actually the property, is under a notice of violation currently. Uh, the property owner uh, has a restriction on the property that dates back to a 2004 Board of County Commissioner's resolutions that prohibits dogs on the property. And the uh, owner of the property was issued a notice of violation for having dogs on the property. Um, and uh, in a notice of viola violation scenario, there's actually two avenues a, a property owner can pursue. One is to show compliance to uh, relieve the notice of violation, or uh, they can request to amend whatever condition uh, that uh, prohibits the, the activity, this being the dogs on the property. Uh, the applicants requested uh, to pursue to amend that condition in the previous board resolution through what's called a minor amendment to a development permit. And that's typically scheduled for an administrative review, uh, but however, the, the Board of County Commissioners ruled in 2004 and placed that condition in their resolution, so we're referring it to you. Um, I did, I, I put an email on all of your desks there. Um, the applicant uh, has requested to continue this hearing. And um, as you can see, the reason stated in the email, um, they'd like to uh, continue it to the first, well, to a meeting date in December. Um, we have uh, the December 3rd BOCC meeting date open for that. <coughs> it's a little bit of a unique situation because we are in a notice of violation on this. Um, so the request is to the board for the continuance, and you can entertain that request if you want. Um, otherwise, staff and the applicant uh, has representatives here uh, to uh, go forward with the hearing if we need to. Otherwise, their, their first request is to continue this. Or, George? So since they're in uh, in violation, if we were to continue this, how would we um, address that violation now, or is it being addressed currently? Uh, as far as addressed, do you mean does it, is a notice of violation relieved at all, or is it just? Can, I'm not sure if I understand the question. What sort of action have we taken, or? Have we taken any action in terms of the violation? We haven't taken any action uh, to date other than issuing the property owner a notice of violation that dogs are on the property and giving them a time frame to act upon that violation, meaning that they either had to get remove the dogs off the property or apply for this application to amend the board resolution. So if we were to table this, then basically we're extending that we're not really acting on that violation at this point. There's, we can't act on that unless we actually make a decision. In effect, what the, as Mike just stated, what the property owner has to do is one of two things. And the election was made to request a modification of the earlier resolution of approval to <coughs> relax the, the dog prohibition on the property. If, if the board denied that request, then the alternative is the only uh, course of action which is to remove the dog simple as that really and so once the property owner has made this request to modify the uh, restriction on the property he is in compliance with what he has to do pursuant to that notice of violation the notice of violation stays on the property until the board determines to either amend the uh, the prohibition or not and then if not until the the, uh, the dog is removed from the property, dogs are removed from the property. So one last question: Are the dogs currently still on the property? I don't know the answer to that question. But essentially, continuing leaves everything kind of status quo. It doesn't create additional penalties for the applicant. It doesn't create any um, mandate for our zoning officer to go out and do something they would be aware that we've continued and I mean I, w I personally feel that the applicant has asked us to continue and um, we're not having a dogs running at large you know additional issue uh, on the property then um, I would be comfortable continuing it 
and that would be that's my that's really my question are dogs running at large or are they being kept inside the house and we, don't, and we don't know that can we continue with conditions i guess is the question um <laughs> I, uh, we don't have the, the ability to uh to enforce at this point is is relaxed pending an action of the board so um Rachel's correct in her description of the effect of the continuation. As to the current status, I haven't been there personally, and, and if my, so the only people who know probably are the property owner's representatives who are here. We can inquire of, of them what's going on in the property right now. Glenn, would you like um, to? Yeah, my name is Glenn Horn, uh, and I represent the owners. and. I'm not aware of the status of the dogs. I believe the dogs are at the, on the property, but there have been no complaints um, since they've been cited uh, for having the dogs there. Uh, but I believe the dogs are on the property, but they're being uh, constrained by the owners. And in general, you're not allowed to have dogs running at large on any property. I mean, off the property. So I would feel comfortable continuing and perhaps you could contact the clients to let them know we did continue on their behalf, but that you know it's very important to keep those dogs constrained until that decision is reached. <coughs> and I would I would also add that um, I would support continuing it uh, to a date certain, but not to continue after that if there's another. Uh, problem in terms of the owners can't be here I think because we, we have to deal with this violation. Agreed. Steve, anything or a motion by anybody? Uh, in terms of date to continue to, Rachel and I will not be here at the December 3rd meeting. That's true. Which, I mean, the rest of the board could discuss it without us. Um, I would prefer to be here for that discussion. Um, I think I would, too. You know. Um, so we could maybe go to December 17th. I have a meeting listed then. What does that calendar look like? Yeah. Or we also have a special meeting on Monday the 15th for the budget, if we needed to put it there. Do you know your applicant's availability for uh, that meeting? I checked on the 3rd and the 17th with them, and they said I, either of those dates work fine. Okay. So, if, you know, the 17th is fine. Let's make it the 17th. <coughs> we have a motion. I'd move to continue this item to December 17th. Second. Any dis uh, no public hearing. Any dis discussion? All those in favor say aye. Uh, Hi. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. The Lily Reader Trust Activity Envelope Review taking this determination. No, over there, right behind you is good. Be right behind Alan. That's good. Oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'm fine. Just a date's chair. Okay. 
except that I think they may try to argue that it's not a takings and we should act on it, even though we stopped an 18 ton boulder from hitting it. Um, on the reader property, um, which I guess if you look just about anywhere, you can see it's behind the ice um, garden, the in-town ice garden, excuse me, right along the Midland Trail. Um, I guess I can't point at anything in particular, but the, <laughs> the maps are, are, are around so you can see. Um, it's surrounded by, on the, the map that's up on the screen, you can see what's shown as lots one, two, three, and four are the Little Cloud subdivision lots, as well as what's shown as that common area. Um, and then the reader parcel is kind of sandwiched below them and above the, uh, the trail. So there's the ice garden. And then across, across Second Street from the ice garden is um, the employee housing complex. Sorry, what's the name of that one? Ajax, Ajax Apartments. Um, so just to, to get you oriented there. Um, so the hearing officer denied um, a request for an activity envelope on the property <coughs> um, pursuant to determination number six of 2014. Um, the primary reasons behind the denial were a rockfall hazard. Um, development is prohibited in the land use code in rockfall hazard areas. Um, there were also some slopes of over 30 and 45 percent included, not necessarily within the building envelope, with, but within some additional envelopes that were proposed. I think Alan will go into this a little bit more, but just to show you. So here's, again, Second Street. The trail is running along here. This is the building envelope. And some additional envelopes were proposed. This is a landscaping envelope. And then an envelope above here was called a geohazard mitigation envelope. This envelope and the landscaping envelope, as you can see, encroach onto steeper slopes. Um, within the building envelope, there's some small areas of steeper slopes, but those comply with our anomaly provision. So, um, again, it was just a partial denial based on slopes, as well as that rockfall hazard issue that affected the entire envelope. Um, just another note, in terms of process on this, an activity envelope is usually a staff level review or community development approval, unless there's an objection. There were objections submitted in the application which took it to the hearing officer, and then it was the hearing officer that um, denied it. Um, quickly on the background, and Alan may speak a little bit more to this, um, this parcel has been in our process many times over the years. Um, there have been Twice, building envelopes have been approved on the property. Once, the vested rights for one of those envelopes was extended. Um, and there was also a 1993 approval. Um, and again, this is the subdivision exemption plat that basically shows that there were lands that were dedicated, purchased by and dedicated to the county, which allowed for the, the completion of the Midland Trail. And then there was also another piece over here. So that was... Um, a, a contract between the county and the and the applicant, the owner of this property, whereby the pieces in green were divided off and became public property. Um, so that's that 1993 subdivision exemption. But so again, just to, to say that this has been um, in front of the county. Rachel, um, did you? I just want to have one clarification because our memo and the hearing officers. Um, report to us keep describing this as tract a of government lot 20 and on the map you just have reader parcel are they one in the same yes tract a of government lot 20 is what's referred to as the reader parcel okay i thought so um, i just want to be the other sure. tracks um i think if i come up to this map I can, um this is tract b again was a piece of what was okay given the county and then Parcel B. So there were several pieces, but Tract A and Tract B of Government Lot 20 were once part of one parcel, and then, but yeah, reader parcel, I guess, is generally how I just refer to it. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure I was yes, clear. And, and it is same. one lot, not capable of being subdivided further, or? Correct. It is, is, is one um, parcel. It is, well, it's zoned R15. It contains 39,000 square feet which does give it 
subdivision potential. Um, that's not what is proposed here. What is unusual and comes out of this 1993 subdivision exemption approval um, was a reservation on the plat. So again, this was um, a under a contract between the county and the owner of the property, Lyle Reeder at the time, um, that specified that all development rights, including floor area ratio, associated with the original lot. So basically, all of these lands, including this triangle down there, are reserved for floor area purposes and development purposes. So that allows for more development on this parcel than would have otherwise been allowed based on just the ratio for this parcel at 39,000 square feet. There's a calculation based on the square footage of what the parcel originally was prior to that division of the property. Um, so that is, is a bit unusual. Um, <coughs> But so anyway, so that was the 1993 approval. Again, there have been envelopes previously approved on this. There were the vested rights were there were no vested rights at this point. Um, so the applicant did apply for a new activity envelope approval, which led to the denial. Um, this is the first step in the takings process, where you make a determination if that denial is a takings or not, and then direct us to come back either with a resolution of denial or a resolution to remediate the taking. Um, so again, just to be clear that this would be sort of the first step in that process. Um, and just to explain what the additional map I put on the floor just to help was a slope, it provides the slope analysis um, whereby, bring that up. So the, the darkest hatch or the steepest slopes, the over 45%, <coughs> 30 to 45% is this hatch, so through here. So you can see in this map where those additional envelopes kind of wrapping around the building envelope get into some of those steep slopes here, which really are the result in this case of when the Midland you know, Railroad came through, that was, that was constructed. This is the steeper slope behind it that goes up and then again, those when you look at that map and see the little cloud road coming above is wrapping right above the top of, of the parcel here. Um, but these steep slopes bring you up to, to that road and those little cloud lots above. Can I ask another? Yes, Rachel, go ahead. Do the little cloud lots four and three have similar rockfall issues and concerns? <coughs> Yeah, as you can see in there, I've shown that there's a mitigation structure that's above lots three and four. It's hard to, you don't really see it very well in there. You see it better above lots one and two. Um, there's a bruge net structure above there that does mitigate for um, rockfall and avalanche hazards in, in, in those two different locations. Um, and there's, sorry, I can't point at anything. That's okay. Um, but between, there, there are two separate mitigation structures. Yeah, I can see it. Oh, okay, with, with a gap in between. Um, there is an area where that is not covered by, by the, the mitigation structures above. Yeah, here. Okay. Were those mitigation structures part of a takings remediation requirement? Not through a takings process, right? Lance maybe can speak to the better to the Little Cloud approvals. Yeah, Little Cloud was, it's a, a long saga, a board approved subdivision and uh, that was approved in the late 80s and it was a long, long time before there was finally any development on it and w other than on lot one right here, but the house that's on lot three, and it is only on lot three, the parcel lines don't exactly line up. Lot four is still undeveloped, as is lot two. But as part of the approval for the driveway, it was the driveway that was in Rockfall and Avalanche, and in order to <coughs> mitigate, to uh, take away the hazard for the driveway as it access lots one and two and three and four, they were required to build an avalanche and rockfall mitigation structure. And the Bruges net was constructed, but not except behind lots three and four and one and two. There's a gap in that structure. And that was what ultimately was required by the Board of County Commissioners and what was built. Okay, okay. One, one last yeah. follow up on that. Um, 
Does the road itself provide some amount of rockfall protection to the reader parcel? Yes, I believe that they will uh, speak to that, that there is some protection from that. Okay, thank you. George. So lot one, there's a development on that currently. Lot two is undeveloped, but it has a buildable site. It does. <laughs> it does. So there's no constraints or mitigation concerns on lot two? No, there will be. There will be, but it's... But there is a the bridge net behind lot two right now, but they, when development comes in, they will have to show that it's adequate to adequately mitigate for development on lot two. And lot three, there's already development? Development and a bridge net behind it. And lot four, no development, but again, they, they would go through the same scenario as lot two? Correct. Okay. Continue. I think I'm. Um, I think I'm done. Any other questions of staff at this point? No. Thank you. Alan, would you like to? Yes, please. For the record, I'm Alan Richmond. I'm representing the Lyle D. Reader Trust, which is the owner of the subject property. To my right is Milton Reader, uh, Lyle Reader's nephew and the trustee, and uh, behind him is Bart Johnson. Um, I just wanted Milt to introduce himself to you for a second, and then I'll take over and run you through a relatively brief presentation. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate you all taking the time to hear our case. Um, I am Lyle Reader's nephew. Milton Reader lives in San Francisco. I've been very close with Lyle all of his life, all of my life. And um, when he was getting on in the years, um, decided that um, I would be his trustee and took me around and visited all of his properties and uh, met with Suzanne, I remember, before he passed, and, and uh, with open space, as a matter of fact, as well, and basically said, look, when I die, it's, it's your, your job to, to resolve all this. So we're, <laughs> we're here to try to make good on Lyle's um, intent. He spent 25 years trying to develop this property. In effect, he, he did, was very cash poor. The reason there's a gap in that fence is because Lyle didn't have the money to contribute to the Bruges net at the time that developer put it in there. Um, and um, he, he went through great pains, I think, to swap, which Alan will get into the history of this property, swap from open space in Hunter Creek that got him the slot <coughs> for development and then agreed with the bike trail um, that the city wanted, and it was really technically county land, but wanted the bike trail, which was the actual rail line tracks, to be open space, so he gave that as long as he could keep the development right on the existing property that he retained, in effect. So. Um, so my role here is just to carry out his wishes. Thank you. Thanks. So in terms of our presentation, we really thought there were two basic questions that we needed to review with the board today. Uh, the first of those is, does the hearing officer's determination deny all reasonable use of the property? And the second of those would be, is that denial contrary to the owner's investment-backed expectations for the property? So we're really kind of focused on your criteria for a takings review and, and trying to work through those with you. And in the context of, of answering those questions, I think we'll take you through much of the background. Suzanne has, has gotten us off to a great start in terms of understanding the, the property, and, and we're happy to answer any questions that you have about it. So um, Government Lot 20, it's, as Suzanne said, it's nearly an acre in size. It's 39,000 plus square feet. It's undeveloped. It's in the R15 zone district. It's located at the base of Shadow Mountain. As you know, it's adjacent to the city limits, um, right behind the ice garden. Um, access is obtained off the second street. Um, and actually, as part of the subdivision plot, there was an access easement created by the city and the county uh, because, as you can see on this drawing, it's probably the simplest way to, to describe it, this track B here, which we all now know as the Midland Trail, the Shadow Mountain Trail, when this area in this area became county property, the property of course was landlocked. It no longer had a direct link on to 2nd Street, but the county on the subdivision plat and in the contract granted an access easement across um, the trail into the property on, on 2nd Street. Um, the property really has been extensively studied. Um, as Suzanne mentioned and, and as Milt mentioned, um, this has been in the process starting all the way back in 1991. So we're, we're going on close to 25 years here of, 
of <coughs> county land, res, land use review of this property. And I think probably the most fundamental thing that's been determined in all of those land use reviews is there's only one place on this property where development can be permitted by the county. Um, Suzanne has pointed that out to you. It's this red area here on this drawing. So it's, it's the bottom of the property. It's a little bit close to Second Street. It's the only area of the property that is not primarily uh, plans over 30% slope. The reason that we wanted this map to be here for you is to demonstrate the analysis of the 30% slope. So these lighter areas, of course, are the areas that are below 30, and the darker areas, which continue up the, the slope, um, are the, the steeper areas that are greater than 30%. So as you go up in an elevation, the property gets quite steep. Um, the other thing that happens when you're low in elevation on the property, at the very bottom of the property, is you're at the greatest distance from the source of the hazards on the site. So the source of the hazards, of course, are coming from the upper reaches of uh, Shadow Mountain. And by being in front of the property, we're at a greater distance from the avalanche and the rockfall. Now, we've had extensive study of the avalanche and rockfall done as part of the um, application process here. Art Mears has done all of that work for us. Art Mears had also done prior work in the area. He did the work for Little Cloud. He, in fact, was the one that recommended the Bruges fence be implemented, and the Bruges fence actually got upgraded at a later date, and is the reason that a recent rockfall event that's happened in the neighborhood was protected. That, that rockfall fence has actually protected um, properties below it from rockfall hazard. Um, Art Mears has done all the studies for us. We didn't bring him here today. We would bring him here for a remediation hearing so that you can hear his analysis and be comfortable that this lot can be properly protected. But um, Art's basic conclusion in terms of avalanche, because we're dealing with both avalanche and rock ball potential here. Um, avalanche hazard actually doesn't reach the building on board. And I can't recall which one of you made mention of the road, but actually it is the road that slows the avalanche down and the avalanche doesn't really get below Little Cloud Road and, and does not reach the envelope for this property. Rock, and, and the state geologist concurs with that conclusion. So we're not in an avalanche hazard situation for this envelope. What we are in is a rockfall hazard situation for this envelope. And, and you began to explore the reason that there is a rockfall hazard here, and it is because there is a gap in the netting that sits above this property. And that gap is the area where rocks can potentially get through. They can break off above, um, above all these sites at the top of, of Shadow Mountain. And they can, in fact, reach this envelope. Um, Mr. Mears studied that. He modeled it. Uh, you've seen <coughs> his modeling before in other applications, so you know the kind of work that he does. Um, and his, his modeling found the degree of the hazard to be quite limited. And so I'm going to quote. Since, since we didn't bring art here, I'm just going to give you three quick quotes from his conclusion section. He says, rocks from rare rockfall events can reach the site, but the probability of rocks reaching the site is small. And he said, secondly, the existing rockfall hazard at the site without mitigation, so if you did nothing whatsoever, falls within the range of many other forms of risk that are commonly accepted by individuals in society. And then the third thing he said, is mitigation, as described in this report, would reduce this risk, risk substantially. And the mitigation that can be accomplished here, the reason that we've identified this envelope would be to have a rockfall catching net right there. So you could place a rockfall catching net just above the site, and it would mitigate for the hazard. The ideal solution, the solution that, in fact, the um, the Colorado Geologic Survey, and that we would love to pursue, would be to close the gap. We approached the neighbors in Little Cloud to see if we could pay for closing the gap on the, the two sides that are now protected, which would actually improve their situation because it would mitigate more completely for their road and their turnaround area that sits below the gap. They turned us down. They will not. Uh, they will not work with us, with us on that. So our choices are we can mitigate in this area, which we will gladly do, or we can reinforce the backside of the structure 
to mitigate for rocks. So either of those are possible and doable, and, and we're completely comfortable with doing those. And as Art says, mitigation as described in the report would reduce this risk substantially. So we have a situation with a limited rockfall hazard that can be mitigated, but the code doesn't differentiate between degrees of rockfall hazard. So a limited rockfall hazard or an extreme rockfall hazard, as far as the code is concerned, the staff and the hearing officer are required to deny those types of, of land use applications. You are the only body that has authority to approve in those circumstances, and, and that's what gets us here today. So in essence, we have two situations here. Number one, other than this one area of the property, the rest of the property contains slopes that are greater than 30%. Your code prohibits us from developing on those slopes. And secondly, we, we have an area here that does not have those slopes, but it is in the gap area, and so it's exposed to a rock ball hazard. So between those two prohibitions, we have no development <coughs> opportunity based on the denial of, uh, of the hearing officer, and our only option would be for you to remediate that, that situation. Other than that, we have no development potential on this lot. So um, that's the, the first point. Um, has all economic use been denied? The answer would be yes. Um, Alan, does Art uh, talk about the, the um, potential of mudslides, debris? Uh, because Shadow Mountain has had a history of mudslides. So you talk about rockfall, but yes. but is, 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 does he include mudslides as well? Or is that, um, has he did he address that at all? No, th that was not a hazard that was identified for this area in our pre-application review and was not something that we studied, I believe. But it's not anything he identified as a hazard okay. when he did so this know, extensive review area is on not, the property. not subject to yeah. that hazard. I think that's a little more central onto closer to lift 1A yeah, coming okay. over town. All right, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so that's point number one, the, the first overall. And then the second area that we wanted to address with you is, is the denial contrary to the owner's investment backed expectations for the property? And there are really <coughs> four factors that we need to, to <coughs> there. Um, and the first would be, how did Mr. Reeder obtain this property? So Lyle Reeder obtained this property in 1986, and that was as a result of a land exchange with the Forest Service. At the time, Mr. Reeder owned 115 acres of patented mining claims in Van Horn Park in the Hunter Creek Valley, and he also owned nine acres above Ashcroft. Those were private inholdings within public lands, and they were places where development could have occurred that would have significantly affected the public's enjoyment of the National Forest. And of course, we all know the Hunter Creek Valley and Ashcroft are two of the most widely used forest areas of our community for hiking and biking and backcountry skiing. Um, you have to place yourself back in time now to the mid-1980s when these land exchange negotiations were going on. The county had not yet adopted rural and remote zoning in that time. So Van Horn Park and Ashcroft were zoned AF1, which is now AFR10. That's a 10-acre zone district that would have allowed, in the Hunter Creek case, up to 11 residences to be built. Um, Lyle traded that land to the Forest Service and that threat of development was extinguished on those inholdings and we provided in our um, application letter a newspaper article from the time that kind of summarized <coughs> the exchange and has Lyle and, and uh, Denny Bashore of the Forest Service shaking hands and um, that was a big deal when that happened um, back in the mid 80s. Um, in exchange he got government lot 20. So one thing we would ask of you as you consider this takings request is please keep in mind that this land exchange is how Government Lot 20 became a private property. And to think about how much valuable land was protected for the public in perpetuity in return for allowing residential development here. We understand it's a difficult site. We understand it's a constrained site. Uh, but a decision was made back in the 80s that it was important to protect that land for the public. Um, so that's factor number one. Factor number two would be the prior land use approvals. Um, as was noted, 
the first approval on this property uh, came all the way back in 1991. And what's interesting about that, this map, you see two areas outlined in red. The lower area is the envelope that we are speaking about today. The upper envelope is actually the envelope that Mr. Reed got approved in 1991. It was, as should be obvious, that we're going up in elevation in this direction. So it was at a higher elevation, higher by about 50 feet. And most of that land was on slopes greater than 30%. So the approval was granted by the Planning and Zoning Commission in 1991 because the code in 1991 contained no prohibitions on development on slopes greater than 30%. Um, but no development occurred, and Lyle came back in to renew that envelope, and that request was denied because in 1994 was when the first major revision to the county code occurred in some 20 years, and um, that included a prohibition on slopes greater than 30 percent. So this envelope was no longer was no longer approvable. Um, Mr. Reeder actually at the time applied to this board for a takings review, and the board said, "Nope, there's no takings here because there's another envelope on this property." And so he had to come back in, and he did. And he came back in, and in 2002, Jim True, the hearing officer, approved that lower <coughs> envelope. And his determination, uh, number 32, 2002, included the following finding. The envelope has limited exposure to potential rockfall and avalanche hazards, and those hazards can be mitigated. So that was the county's finding um, 12 years ago. And it's the same envelope that we're proposing today. Um, the approval in 2002, of course, expired in 2005. Nothing had happened. Uh, but the board then granted an extension, <coughs> this board granted an extension of that approval in 2006. And again, the rights expired in 2009. So that's kind of the, the history of, of the, um, the land use actions with one exception, and that's the third factor, which was the conveyance of the Shadow Mountain Trail to the county which occurred in 1993. Um, this was in the middle of Lyle having received his first development approval and uh, looking to develop the property. Um, Mr. Reeder and the county entered into a contract. He sold and donated land to the county for the Shadow Mountain Trail. So again, the green area is the area that was sold and donated. And you'll note that parcel B is a separate parcel from Tract A and Tract B. Um, so these were contiguous and this was discontinuous. Um, in the real estate contract, in the deed of conveyance, and in the subdivision exemption plat, there was this language that Suzanne referred to, which says the <coughs> owners of Tract A reserved to themselves the development rights, including the floor area ratio that was associated with the original parcel. So that was something that the county agreed to contractually at the time. Um, and it, it essentially set out the development rights of the property. Um, Lyle spent time working with staff to verify what those development rights are. Uh, because parcel B is a separate um, tract from tract A, the property does have two exempt growth management rights, one for tract A and one for parcel B. Um, and it also, the floor area all accumulates on the remaining parcel. But obviously to, to build on and, and use any of those rights, um, you need to obtain site plan approval. And if the house were to be larger than 5750, you would need to use TDR. So, those are givens that, that come with this. The, the property doesn't have the right uh, to simply be built on. We still need to go through site plan approval. And if a house were to be larger than 5750 in the floor area would allow that, then it's going to require TDRs for that. So we're here requesting the activity envelope designation, and then we would come back with a site plan review. The fourth and final factor that I'm going to mention is the value of the property, which is something that is significant in uh, your, your takings criteria. And uh, in 2013, the property was under contract to be sold for just under $4 million. So it is clearly a property with considerable value in, in today's market. So just to, to conclude and summarize, 
Um, this land was obtained through a, a land exchange with the Forest Service. The lands that were conveyed um, to the public were critical public, in, excuse me, critical private inholdings. So there was a public benefit when the parcel became a development property. Um, there was then a subsequent conveyance to the county for the Shadow Mountain Trail. So that was a second public benefit uh, that Mr. Reeder provided. There was a contractual agreement between the county and the applicant as to the development rights associated with the property. There have been previous site plan approvals determining this to be the appropriate location on the property where development can avoid the steep slopes. And the prior approvals have also demonstrated that the geohazards can be mitigated. So we think that these facts demonstrate to you that this denial leaves the owner with no other land use options to pursue and that the owner has reasonable investment backed expectations for the property and that yeah, has value. One of the supplemental comment I'd like to make is that, that cumulative uh, Lyle has paid over $450,000 uh, in property taxes over the, the holding period, uh, assuming and it was taxed as a development parcel as well. Rachel. Yeah, thank, uh, you. thank you for your presentation, Alan. And I guess this question is a little more for uh, Lance and <coughs> John Ely. Um, the uh, process related to a takings determination and then a final remediation, if uh, takings was determined today because at least right now the hearing officer's decision denies 100% of the use, uh, during the remediation hearing, which would be subsequent, what, what are the options the board would have towards remediation? Could it be um, installation of the fence as a requirement of site plan approval? Would it be a potential of saying a house has to be reinforced along the back wall with X, you know, or, or that the house itself might have to be smaller? What are the options that may um, be considered a legal remediation but might not restore to 100 percent of economic value today Do, does our choices have to restore to 100 percent no you do not have to restore or realize the highest possible economic value or return on an investment in fact Action would never view along those lines. Anyway, what has to happen is a reasonable use of the property. So, when you are considering what a remediation would be appropriate, all those things that you mentioned, Rachel, plus any number of other uh, aspects of development can be considered and addressed by the board in a remediation resolution. The unique aspect of this particular property would be. Um, restriction of size. Um, the county obligated itself contractually to recognize a certain amount of square footage available for development on the site. Um, the, uh, so that, that is there. Um, appropriate remediation of that amount of square footage might require some portion of it be uh, built underground, for example, or a reduction of the profile or aspect of the structure that presents itself to the to Shadow Mountain you know, or something along those lines but uh, I think based on the uh, the contract that was entered into um, with Lyle uh, the square footage for the property has been established and refresh my memory is that the 8750 or is it a uh, excuse me 5750 or is it it's for a FAR ratio recognizing the ability to utilize all of the portion of the original property, even those uh, portions that were ultimately conveyed to the county. And I'm not sure where that FAR gets the property. It's um, maximum allowable floor area of 9,800 square feet of floor area, which does not include subgrade space and garage. This is a property in the UGB, which would be under current code allowed 4,000 square feet subgrade, 750 garage on top of that 9,800. So just in, as clarification there, because I remember reading that um, last night, the uh, subgrade is exempt. So you're saying that 
we could through the takings remediation we can force some of the subgrade but the subgrade is exempt so does that mean it might be an additional subgrade in other words if the if the if the board determines the hazard is of such a quality that the the best way to mitigate the risks or the dangers involved with development of the site would be to reduce the aspect of the structure that's you know sticking out and be hit by some falling rock uh, then you, that's an element of construction that could be considered the only thing I think that is fairly off the table is just the overall square footage and I'm sorry why, why, why is that John because we've, we've uh, reduced <coughs> FAR on other constrained sites Typically speaking, we would have the ability to look at that and that the FAR, or rather not so much the FAR, but the overall square footage could be reduced to a level that um, adequately mitigates the danger of a particular hazard. In this particular property, though, we entered into a contract with the, uh, with the owner that provided that as part of the consideration for acquiring what was nominated on a, a plat that was accepted in, uh, and recorded through the county um, that the developability of the uh, what uh, what Suzanne has labeled as the reader parcel would be based upon the overall size of the property for its calculation of available square footage. So, having committed to that contractually, and that and that contract language surviving the closing that got all of those properties to the county I think we're obligated to to live by those terms and I, I think the original question that Rachel put forth was what are our <coughs> options with remediation another option is to purchase the property with county funds if there was a willing seller but that is a that is an option acquisition is, is always an option to be discussed with the property owner or to uh, uh, be considered independently of the property owner for that matter. I'm, I am unaware of any discussions that have taken place with open space and trails that would indicate there's a, 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 des, a, a desire or a recommendation that would be coming from that board to acquire them. And I'm just reflecting that that's a possibility Absolutely. in a takings <laughs> application. Yeah. And essentially, I just was asking around the outline of the process. Today would be the determination and, um, you know, I'll say frankly, based on the memo, the packet, and information, I don't know how to reach any other conclusion than there is a takings. But then the range of alternatives for remediation are what we would see at a future hearing. And I would like to see that range be as complete as possible, even if, you know, staff might eliminate some on one side or the other as being too, too generous or too restrictive. I'd like to just see a full range of, of brainstorming opportunities of what are the best and um, uh, best remediation options for us in the future, and certainly with time for Alan and the applicant to review those as well, you know, before we come back to the table. And as Alan mentioned, we would have Art Mears back as well to describe fully what, what the impact of the remediation that he suggested would be on the, on the property in okay. detail. George. Alan, you said that uh, this property was under contract last year. Did, did the contract fall through because of this hearing determination, or you want to jump yes, in? in effect, b b due to the lack of clarity on what could be developed on the property. <coughs> Steve, a uh, question for Suzanne: um, If the Tract B had not been conveyed to the county for the for the trail. Would the parcel have been more had more flat ground to be developed, and would they have been able to move the building envelope a little bit further downhill and been able to do it right now without having a, a takings proceeding? Um. I don't think so. I don't think it provides much leeway. As you can see, it's, I mean, it's a pretty narrow strip that was acquired here. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with what that looked like before the trail was on it, but I think there's always, there's, you know, a raised bed where the railroad came through. So I think 
you know, even without the trail, it looked pretty similar. So there really wasn't any area there. And then this was seen as a separate parcel with its own development right, very small. Obviously, the allowed FAR on that would be very small. But, you know, the possibility before was a house here and a house over here. And this, when you see it on, you know, up on the map, you can kind of see where that triangle is. If you look, you can see where the volleyball courts are, the sand courts. To the left of those, you can see that triangle in there. Um, you know, that's the location where there had been the possibility of, of another house in addition to one on this property. Mm -hmm. So, but on this site, I don't think that really, you know, provided any, you know, a better, a better location um, okay. on the property. Um, and today we just need to determine if it's a takings or not. And most of our discussion has been about remediation, actually, but that, the stuff we're discussing, we will have a chance to discuss a re remediation hearing. Right, in the subsequent hearing. And um, I would like to have a site visit to the site before we do the remediation hearing. Rachel. Um, yeah, and additionally uh, on that for the next round, um, I'd like a refresher on the driveway access. I, I recall different things from the time on the city council table and whether it was going to have a bridge to keep the trail over top of a underground access or was it going to be a safe crossing at grade and you know I just would love to have that refresher as well where that stands. Definitely. But um, other than that, I don't know if you are ready for a motion, Rob, or? Sure, I'll accept the motion. Um, again, it's, it's my <coughs> impression from reading through this that uh, at least at this point in time with the determination of the hearing officer, which I would uphold, um, that there has been a um, takings and let's see, let's see. Pursuant to Section 240-150 of the Code, the BOCC is determining the property owner would be denied all reasonable use and economic return on the property as a result of the questioned determination of, by the hearing officer, and uh, the BOCC shall direct staff to prepare a resolution um, uh, approving the takings hearing. I guess that's the best language I can come up with from here. I think remediating the taking. For, uh, the to, in order to remediate the taking. We have a second. A second. Is that language sufficient, John? Is that appropriate? It'll work. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 There you go. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. How soon? Do you want to schedule that? I think it was I mean, on. I the, think we're prepared to come back. We can in, come back in, in two, two, weeks. Weeks. two weeks. I think it was actually on the future agendas. I noticed. <coughs> we had we had you know tentatively <coughs> put it on the next meeting for the, yeah. the remediation. But while it's fresh in everybody's mind, and but with the site if we visit, it might have to. We'll see if we can coordinate. See if we can coordinate a site visit. Do that prior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Luckily, it is a fairly easy one to get to. We can, yeah, it's not a long travel. We can do a walking travel. site visit, so that helps. <laughs> Thanks very much. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, John Peacock has stepped out of the room, apparently. Yeah, he just had a phone call really quick. Run while you can. <laughs> Why don't we... Uh, Take two minutes and see if we can find him. Otherwise, we don't meet again until next week. We meet tomorrow. Oh, we do. That's right. <laughs> you know the ones at the high school. We don't uh, usually meet on Thursdays, but do. we do. Uh, I seen um, let's take a five-minute break. Okay. Use your finger.
Welcome back. This is the Board of County Commissioners regular meeting, Wednesday, November 5th. We're into our open discussion. John, any open discussion for us? Yeah, just uh, real quick, Rob. Uh, as the board probably saw in uh, both internal emails and in the, the media, the, we have hired a new airport director, uh, John Kenny. It's going to be joining us. Uh, he brings to the position 28 years of uh, aviation management experience, including in uh, um, communities not so dissimilar in terms of being uh, resort-based with uh, a high level of concern about, about impacts, being Scottsdale and Long Beach, as well as significant experience at larger airports like uh, D DIA and LAX. But um, it was a uh, extremely difficult process. We had a, a lot of community input and staff input, um, as well as tenant input from, from the airport. I know uh, both both George and Steve had an opportunity to participate on, on one of the interview panels, the community interview panel. And uh, we're real excited to bring him on board. The uh, new news is that um, we are going to have him in town tomorrow. He and his wife are uh, looking at, at uh, the, the valley and what they're going to be moving and all that sort of stuff. So we are going to try and get them here for open discussion, uh, do an introduction to you guys tomorrow. Great. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer any about, about him or that process. No, no questions. Anything else? Now I have uh, some open discussion items for you tomorrow, but I wasn't prepared to bring them today. Commissioners, any other comments for today's meeting? We're in this room again tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Thank you. What time do we start tomorrow? 9 a.m. We start at 9. It's early tomorrow. Um, we've got a pretty full agenda. We do need to be out of the room by 4 o'clock. Yeah, and actually when they start at 4, it's closer to 10 till. To, 10 till, so they can yeah. Set up and yeah. And that, I think that will not be a problem tomorrow's budget presentation and such should be uh, not go as long and uh, I don't think we're going to need as long as we have uh, budgeted for MOIs and that sort of thing tomorrow. Great. Do you accept a motion to adjourn? I will. And motion. I didn't mean to cut off if anybody else had open discussion items hmm. other than John. Okay. Motion I, a second. Second. second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you grassroots. Do you want to catch up?